chapter 11, Ringmaster's Word. And this chapter is dedicated to Young Wicked, the man behind the boards right now, adding all the little extra freshness you hear here and there behind my words. Whoop whoop! We had the Beverly Kills 50187 EP between albums, and we weren't basically poor anymore. We weren't rich at all. We weren't even middle class. But for the very first time in my life, though, we weren't dirt poor. We could afford McDonald's or whatever was right down the street from our office anytime we wanted. Our office was still Alex's mom's basement on Nine Mile Road. Carnival of Carnage had sold almost 10,000 copies by now. 10 fucking thousand copies, all independently. Despite the big news, however, Alex came back from a music seminar with some bad news. We didn't have any record companies sucking our dicks. Damn. As a matter of fact, we didn't have anybody sucking our dicks. Anywhere we went, every record store, every time we hung out at St. Andrews Hall, nobody had a fucking thing to say to us. Nothing but mean mugs and shoulder shrugs everywhere we went. Whatever we told people we sold, they were always dead certain we were lying about it. Besides, every time I talked to Esham's brother James, he would tell me they were selling 100,000 records. Same thing with Kid Rock. Oh yeah, I'm at about 70,000 units. We believed it all, too. Sure, we later learned that they were mega hyping that shit up the whole time. Right then, we all thought that we had a lot of catching up to do. Them lying to us all, all those years, that turned out to be the best thing ever for us. Because all we did was try harder and harder to catch up to their imaginary record sales. Them lying, them boosting their record sales, just made us work harder to try to catch up to their lies. The truth was, all along, it was hard enough for fucking Ice Cube to sell 10,000 records in the Detroit area, let alone a local group. It didn't matter to us, though. We really didn't care. Ice Cube was our target. Now, him and the Beastie Boys, all the big time shit, that's what we were trying to catch up to. We entered the studio to make the second Joker's card, the Ringmaster. Mike E. Clark was still pretty much busy as hell back then, treating us like hoes. But we still entered the studio with him because he was the best thing in Detroit, period. About Mike. Don't get me wrong, Mike Clark was never a dick to us. Mike was never a dick to anybody for that matter. He was always friendly as hell, full of energy, and full of life. You gotta know Mike. He's full of charisma and karma. He's super, super cool and all, but he was just so fucking busy. From the first day I ever met Mike, he was always cool as hell to chill with, though. His only problem back then was he was so fucking busy and in demand. He couldn't work with us exclusively because we weren't making any real money. So Mike had to work with about 10 bands at that time in order to make all his end meets. And when I say bands, I do mean bands, rock and roll bands, and rap groups. The fact is, Mike is the fucking bomb and everybody who has ever worked with him wants him for themselves alone. But during the recording of Ringmaster, we were just one of the ten bands Mike was doing at the time. That's why I say we were just bitches to him. That and the fact that we were just another one of the many rap groups and bands who were always bugging him for studio time. He was moving up in the world though. He had his own studio now. He didn't have to rent out a room at the Temper Mill studio. He had his own fucking studio right at his house. We buried ourselves in a studio as much as possible. Shit was magical during this period. Because we knew we actually had people waiting for this album. We were actually defining what ICP was and what it could be. We wanted to make a statement to direct our energy. We wanted to mix comedy and horror and hold it all up like a mirror to a city full of gangsters and scrubs just like us. The image of the Joker's card came to me as a ringmaster throwing up the forks up and the forks down gang signs. To us, that meant that all sets, all gangs could have clown love. That's why the ringmaster holds up both signs. You see, in Detroit, in the southwest side especially, there were several gangs. The Cash Flow Posse, the Latin Counts, all sorts of them. They were either 
Forks up, gang, or forks down, gang. Sort of like out in L.A., you got a bunch of different gangs that are either crip or blood. They may have individual sets or streets they represent or neighborhoods they represent, but they're either blood, which means they get along with other blood gangs, or they're either crip, which means they get along with other crip gangs. Well, here in the Midwest, in Chicago and Detroit, it's about forks up or forks down. Several different gangs were either forks up or they were forks down. And that's why the ringmaster threw up bull signs, because he was representing all sets. I don't know where the hell we got all those fresh ideas, except to say from the Dark Carnival. We even decided to put our own comic book out with the ringmaster called The Wicked Clowns. I wrote it, and Joey drew it. Once again, we were hanging out up at Kinko's, like curly hairs on nuts, when we weren't in the studio. That fucking comic book was hella, hella hard work. We spent more time up at Kinko's than ever during the Ringmaster era, and that's saying a lot. We had to get the comic book printed in Canada, so it took us a million trips across the border to smuggle them all back. At least we had a comic book now. It wasn't in color or anything, but the cover was, and it was funny. Not even Ice Cube had a fucking comic book. Right from the rip, we wanted to be about more than just music. We wanted to have all kind of little trinkets and little fucking collectibles that come along with us. Not just the CDs, but all kinds of additional collectible flavor. That's why right then during the Ringmaster era, way back in 1990 fucking three or four, we were drawing a comic book. And it took Shaggy forever to draw that bad boy. And it's still available today. It's a collector's item, and it should be, because it's fucking dope and it's fucking funny as hell straight up we were off on our own thing now and making new moves we finally stopped watching our opponents in the race we just looked ahead and little did we even know it but we were leaving everybody in the dust promoting 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 non-stop night and day day and night we hustled at every kinkos in the state we even went to kinkos in other states just to reuse our snaky tactics because they weren't hit to us yet we sat up at kinkos so much that my ass was shaped just like the bottom of a kinkos chair we brought our own chairs into the kinkos that we kept in alex's truck we brought food to kinkos ordered fucking pizzas to kinkos all that i'm telling you we lived at Kinko's, making endless amounts of demo packages, flyers, fan club newsletters, bios, everything. It's all about work, you fucking jerk. You don't sit around and wait to be discovered, asshole. You fucking work! Bust your ass if you want it. Chase it. Make it happen. Own it. Don't sit and wait. Don't sit and pray, because God ain't appreciating your lazy ass. Put some effort into it, you bitch! All you fucking local bitch bands that never made it! Ha ha ha! You lazy fuck! Fuck it though. I know all this sounds boring as hell. And if you want, you can skip over to the other chapters about, let's see, how I hung out with Slash, or about how Billy just about blew the guy from Radiohead's Grill Out, and all that other dirt from being in the WWF and WCW. Skip right ahead, because this shit is about the struggle, motherfucker. Juggalos, or whoever's hearing this, you've got to understand, this is what really went on. Promoting, promoting, promoting! This is the true story behind ICP CDs and concerts. It ain't fresh as them rappers make it seem in the videos. At least for us it never was. We had to walk the whole way alone because nobody else would give us a free lift. You ain't gonna read no rock stars book where motherfuckers are talking about kinkles and flyers and shit as much as us because they never had to deal with that shit. Some did, a little here and a little there, but nobody, nobody out there walk the whole fucking way like we did no motherfucking buddy my only point is that you can truly do whatever you want in this world even if you never once receive a break along the way you can still do it it just takes a lot of fucking work but you can be an astronaut or you could be an asshole you can be whatever the fuck you want on this planet it's true you just have 
to fucking work. The good thing is that once you get to where you're trying to go, you can look back and say, I don't owe shit to any motherfucking buddy. So it might seem stale that I got all these stories about making flyers, promoting, and selling records in Detroit instead of real rock and roll shit like supermodels eating out each other's nettings while we're sipping Caribbean wine and high-fiving with Tommy Lee. Believe me, this shit was hard work. Now, back to our stale story. About seven weeks before we put the Ringmaster out, we drove all the way down to Cincinnati to get the tapes and CDs pressed up. We had to look for a pressing plant that worked for the cheapest, the most product for the lowest amount of money. We fucking shopped. We budget shopped. We checked out every CD and tape pressing plant in the United States. And the cheapest, best bargain was in Cincinnati, Ohio. So we jumped in Alex's fucking rusty ass bucket and we bounced. We chose this place called QCA to do the job. I wonder if they're still in business. We wanted to go there personally to show them exactly how we wanted it done. Just like we had done a few years earlier with Dog Beats. Sure enough though, four days before the release of the Ringmaster, we got the CDs and tapes back and they were all fucked up. Typos all over the place, wrong foil and everything. Even though we had to drive all the way there to show them exactly how we wanted it done, they still fucked it all up. At first, they just dissed us about it. They told us, sorry, but there was nothing they could do for us. We were so pissed that somebody was truly about to get hurt. The street came pouring back out of us. It was going down, y'all, for real. We were plotting and planning an actual attack on their pressing plant. Straight up, we were about to bring the streets to the QCA pressing plant in Cincinnati. Right when we got the call, they had made us another 10,000 cassettes and 10,000 CDs for absolutely free. This was like a fucking dream come true. We now had twice the shit to sell. 40,000 units, and we were gonna sell them all. That was a break, and I'll never forget it. Thanks to Alex and his threatening tactics, they actually remade 20,000 more CDs and cassettes. 40,000 in all. 20,000 fucked up ones and 20,000 good ones. And we were about to sell all of them bitches. Now, I will admit, that was a break. But that's only because we threatened them and we were serious about it. We were about to surround them and blow their fucking windows out. And you know I ain't playing. Ringmaster hits the streets and his mighty era began. My brother had now been out of the army for a while doing his thing. He started working with us full time, helping us promote the fuck out of the ringmaster. Even the fucking army and Desert Storm War couldn't prepare Rob for the amount of work we put in while promoting. He got out of one war just to join another. Yes, he was in Desert Shield and Desert Storm. My brother Rob was all over Kuwait and Iraq and all that shit during that war out in the fucking desert with Scud missiles flying everywhere. It was fucking crazy. He should write his own book just about that. But he is now back out of that war and in this war. Alex's mom basement was now the psychopathic records warehouse and shipping department, as well as the office. When we weren't flyering, we were down there taping up boxes of CDs, shirts, and shipping them out. Check this out. We bought this huge mega roll of duct tape from this used office supply store. It wasn't really duct tape, it was actually more like this thin ass light brown packaging tape shit. The roll was just enormous. I mean it was seriously about three feet thick, no lie. I think maybe it was used on some kind of giant box folding machine or something. But now we had it and it was fucking humongous. 30 or 40 pounds of nothing but tape. We all stood around looking at it and we said, by the time this roll of tape is gone, we will have easily shipped out enough shit and sold enough records to get a record deal. We were positive of that. There was no way we could have been wrong about that. So we thought the ringmaster was powerful. powerful.
our record was selling. Detroit Scrubs and Thugs were all taking major notice of Insane Clown Posse. Juggalos were emerging from the darkest corners of the state. Other bands were just making music to jam to. We were becoming an underground phenomenon. We set up a bunch of in-store appearances alone this time. Just ICP with no fucking Kid Rocks. At the in-stores, lines of kids were wrapped around the stores twice sometimes. Every kid who came through the line was just like us. They looked like us, they dressed like us, they talked like us and all that. No, I'm not saying that we influenced them in their style. I'm saying that they already had the same style as us. We were all the same kind of people. Scrubs, flubes. We were all being drawn together as underdogs. They were all pissed and ready to do something about it, just like us. It felt like we already knew everybody. We seemed like they all wrestled in NAW with us back in the day. They were all thugs with ICP for years. It was crazy. It was like we already knew everybody somehow. That's how it felt. All these ninjas coming out to get autographs, they were just like us. Joey and I were finding out that there have always been other people out there who thought, lived, breathed, and chilled the same as we did all along. Our music was just helping us all find each other. It was crazy. We couldn't push it out fast enough. Juggalos were telling future Juggalos about the dark carnival. Detroit was steady shaking. There were many earthquakes everywhere. Something was growing under the dirt. Something powerful, large, and mega was emerging. We kept spreading our Juggalo poison. Box after box was leaving that fucking basement. Our fucking fat roll of tape remained fat, but it was definitely being tested. We were blowing up so big, we had to buy an office out in Oak Park so Alex's mom's neighbors didn't think we were drug dealers coming and going out of the house at all hours. It was almost like a dream come true, having our own office. I absolutely loved that little fucking two-room office. I would spend the night there at least two nights a week and just chill, and I hated going home. I used to bring chicks with me there and fuck them on this big-ass conference table all the time. It was so fresh. We used to get chicks from the ICP hotline. That's right. We'd leave a new message every day and chicks would leave their messages and we'd call them back and be like, well, what up then? And hook up with them. It was the shit. We even bought our first company car, a little Suzuki sidekick with fat rims and ground effects. You probably don't even remember ground effects, do you? They were the shit. No more getting out of Alex's rusted out caddy in front of everybody at the in stores. We used that office and fresh ass car 24 7. Damn, I remember that Suzuki sidekick. It even had the fresh purple neon lights underneath it that were illegal. That's why we always got pulled over in that bitch. But man, we love bouncing that fucking fresh purple Suzuki sidekick with the ground effects and the neon purple lights that you no longer see because they were too distracting, but we were fresh in that bitch. At the ringmaster surface, it was just clear. We owned Detroit's underground. That roll of packaging tape was getting smaller, a little bit smaller. Everything seemed cool except for one thing. Alex, we've now sold 30,000 copies of the ringmaster. Where's that fucking record deal? I asked him. And he said, why don't you go to that big ass Jack the Rapper convention coming up in a couple months and find out. The 1993 Jack the Rapper convention was this big rap industry thing held in Atlanta for all the players and would be players of the rap game willing to shell out a $300 ticket. Rudy and I drove down there thinking we were the shit. By the time the convention came, the ringmaster had sold 40 thousand units all on our own record companies were going to be hanging off our dicks or so we thought little did we realize that absolutely nobody outside of the detroit area had a clue as to the hell we were we sold 40,000 units all right all in metro detroit and around flint 
When we walked in the hotel where the convention was held, right away we saw every rapper and their mama was standing there slapping stickers of their group everywhere. They were just like us, promoting. We started doing the same thing, slapping our motherfucking posters up all over the walls and just trying to blend in. This wasn't nothing new to us. We had crazy skills at promoting. I remember I went up to Redman and gave him a CD and then the EPMD and any motherfucker who would take it. We walked around that bitch with our chins up like, yeah, we sold 40,000 fucking records. Ringmasters had 40,000. People still weren't hearing it. Every rapper there had a story that beat ours. 40,000 units? That ain't shit, dog. Back in Oklahoma City, me and my crew sold 130,000 units. We couldn't fucking believe it. Everybody was fresher than us somehow. I was getting mad. Rudy just got drunk. We found ourselves on the elevator with Tag Team. You remember them? They had that song, Whoop, there it is. Whoop, there it is. That shit was out and blowing up at the time. So we're in the elevator with them, and it was just about the biggest single of that year. What up, y'all? One guy asked. What up, I said. He put out his hand for a debt. Tag Team. Rudy shook his hand. ICP, what up? We started talking that small time bullshit talk people make in elevators, especially at business conventions, and we told them we're from Detroit. Then one of the guys asked us, so how are we doing up in Detroit? Are we on any radio up there? Rudy, drunk off his ass, answered, well, you know, I ain't really heard too much since that whole little whoop thing y'all did. Wow, I couldn't believe Rudy just said that to them. That whole little Whoop thing was the biggest selling rap single of all time. And Rudy just called it a little Whoop thing. Well, we hit our floor and got off the elevator right quick. I was just like, holy fuck. Rudy didn't stop to think about what had just happened. He stumbled over to the beer line. Suddenly, Kid, that one guy with the high top fade from Kid and Play, kind of cut in front of him. Rudy liked beer, but he loved trouble. Hey, what's up with that, man? He yelled. Kid apologized immediately. Oh, I'm sorry, bro. I didn't know this was the line. Rudy was drunk. I don't give a fuck if you're a motherfucking kid and play, motherfucker. <laughs> Rudy was about to beat the ninja up from kid and play. I couldn't believe this was happening. It was funny as hell, though. We paid 600 bucks to come here and get a record deal. And all we were doing was burning bridges we never had to begin with. Fuck it. We pissed off tag team and kid and play. Might as well go for the hat trick. Snoop Dogg and his death row records posse were premiering their new movie. Murder was the case that they gave me. It was kind of a big fucking deal because back then, not every rapper was making many movies like they do now. Rudy stumbled up to the door of the screening room and this big bold letters was a sign. Do not open door. Film in progress. Come on, dog, Rudy said. Let's go see this shit. Let's just wait till the next showing, I told him. Rudy opened both doors, and the darkened room suddenly filled up with light. <laughs> suddenly, Snoop and about 50 other people were turning around in their seats to see who the assholes were that just opened the door in the middle of the film. The assholes were Rudy and me. Now, rather than take a seat in the back, Rudy was loud as ever. Oh, my, my, my bad. Now nah, go ahead, watch the movie. The screen's over there. Why are you watching me for shit? Don't mind us. We finally found some seats. Five minutes later, Rudy leaned over and whispered to me, man, it ain't no bitches in here, man. Let's get the fuck out of here, dog. He at least bothered to whisper, dog, don't go back outside, I begged him. If you open them doors, all that light's gonna fill the fucking room again. Dog, this shit is whack, man. Let's break, bro. By now, people were turning around, me mugging us for talking anyway, so I figured we better leave before we get our asses beat. We ninja to the back, and Rudy threw open the doors again like he was escaping a burning building. <laughs> Just as the doors closed back up, I thought, I thought we were cool, but Rudy suddenly yelled, Southwest, bitch! We ran. <laughs> So fresh. At this point, I had just about enough of this convention, but I figured I'd give it at least one last try. There was a room that had A&R men from all labels who would sit down and talk to you. It was almost closed for the day, and we wanted to get the fuck out of there, so I bribed a kid for his place in line. Think about that. 
I actually paid this motherfucker 40 bucks to have his place in line to talk to the A&R from the record company. He must have not wanted it as bad as we did because he stepped right the fuck out of line and gave me his spot. I sat down in front of the A&R guy. Here it is, man. I said, handing him a copy of the Ringmaster. I had five minutes to give him my speech. Man, this record sold 40,000 copies in Detroit. Here are photos of the group. Me and my boy wear clown makeup, blah, blah, blah. The guy was just looking at me like, shut the fuck up and get the fuck out of here. He didn't ask me one question. Talking to him was like talking to a telephone pole. All right, we'll listen to it. Peace. Peace my ass. He could have given a shit less. Luckily, on our way back, there was an independent wrestling show in Atlanta, which was pretty fucking fresh. So Jack the Rapper trip was a total waste. Southwest, bitch! We may not have been shit at the Jack the Rapper convention, but back in the D, we were stars again. We booked a show at the Ritz. The same stale-ass place we played for 250 disinterested Eshan fans a year and a half earlier. This time, the building was sold the fuck out at 1,800 Juggalos. We had face paint on, too. Believe that. Not only us, but half the fucking crowd did, too. We had a song on Carnival Carnage called The Juggler. Then I would do it on stage, I'd say, you can't fuck with the juggler. What about you, juggalo? Are there any juggalos in here? The fans took it from there. The word juggalo was official. Juggalos were like our very own underground cult of followers. We were the band you never heard on the radio or saw on MTV, but everybody in the area knew the name, and only the juggalos actually listened to us. We were getting so big, we were getting even more player-hated in our beloved Southwest. Rudy and I rolled by Clark Park and our sidekick, and people just threw shit at us. Fuck ICP! Y'all ain't shit! It was weird as hell. We had some money in our pocket. We were selling out concerts. Our ugly asses even had hot supermodel looking bitches wanting to fuck us. Still, somehow we didn't have a fucking record deal. Yes, we were getting some skins, I'll say right here, but it was all phony skins. It was just groupie skins. You have to understand though, groupie skins are like prostitutes. They're fucking you, but they ain't really fucking you because they want to fuck you. They're fucking you so they can say they fucked you. They're fucking you to get props, just like a hooker fucks you to get money. So groupie sex ain't really fulfilling if you're a real man. If you're a real man, you want a bitch to fuck you because she wants to fuck you. That's good sex when a bitch is scratching your back, loving you, fuck her. I'm telling you now, as a grown ass man, that's good sex. If a bitch actually really is attracted to you and wants to suck your dick for her pleasure, that's what the fuck I'm talking about. But back then, we would take sex in any fucking form. A hottie willing to fucking blow you real quick in the back of your sidekick? Absolutely. Bring it on. We didn't understand it wasn't authentic, though, but we took it any way we could get it. Life was getting busy as hell. We had places to be and projects to get done. Our rapping careers were truly underway. Finally, Finally, I had to look ahead and keep moving this life in a new, quicker pace. I broke up with Lori. Remember, we had supermodel-looking chicks willing to fuck us now. It was time to move on, and move on I did. I ended up regretting it for years. A long time after Lori, all I ever met was fake-ass groupie after fake-ass groupie. That made Lori look like an angel. Nowadays, I feel different about Lori. For some reason now, when I look back into the past, all I seem to remember is her bitching at me all the time. I seem to have forgotten her fresh points. I only remember her bitching about the money I owed her, about staying out promoting too late every night, straight up bitching about everything I did. I'm happy as hell now not to be with that stupid bitch. Even though thinking about sex we had, it was all right, it was pretty cool. She was the first woman to ever make me nut by giving me head. But yo, she always made me wear a fucking rubber. How stale is that? My girlfriend always made me wear a fucking rubber. Actually, she was smart, you know what I'm saying? Now that I really, really think about it, because I was fucking plenty other nettings with no condom. Yes, it's true. When I was in my 20s, I was buck wild. Yes, yes. Yes, she made me wear rubber all the time. 
What kind of bullshit was that? Anyway, once Lori and I were over, Joey, Billy, and I all decided we should get a place together. At the same time, my brother Rob and Rudy had both also ended long-ass stale bullshit relationships. All of us agreed, let's all get a place together and promote 24-7. Fuck the bitches and everything else all around. We were self-sufficient. We were a record company with local hit albums. And all we cared about was making all that grow bigger and better. We couldn't afford anything fresh yet, but we all knew we wanted to live somehow near downtown Detroit, where the fresh shit was always going down, the mecca of all the action, the greatest place to be promoting. We ended up moving into a scrubbiest neighborhood in Detroit, a place known to local crackheads and hookers everywhere. Cass Corridor. Now, just for the record, I must say these days, the Cass Corridor area is much nicer. They built big buildings for college students, and they have all kind of stores everywhere, and it's much, much nicer. But back in these days, it was a fucking crack haven, and it was fucked up. It was all drug dealers, freaks, and hookers mixed in with crazy hippie-looking college kids who have the balls and the drug habits to want to live there, too. We fucking loved it in Cass Corridor, except for my fucking sidekick always getting broken into. They stole the fucking airbag out of it once. They stole the fucking radio out of it. Rob and Rudy got an apartment with me, Billy, and Joey on the apartment directly across the hall from them. We were on the third floor of a three-floor apartment building-sized crack house. Our rent was 245 bucks a month. Our bathtub always had roaches crawling around, and there was never a shower head, which meant to use it, you would have to sit down. That meant there was a chance of a bug swimming up your butthole. So instead, we just used the nasty tub to hold all the fan mail we were now getting. We'd just run across to my brothers to take a shower. I remember sitting on a toilet and reading fan mail every day because the bathtub was full of fucking fan mail from fresh ass juggalos. It was dope. It was wild because there were people who used to fuck next door and it would knock my whole fucking cable box off my TV. There was some serious rough fucking going on over there. You just hear this guy, this big fat guy, fucking the shit out of bitches. It sounded like they were in the same room with us. I didn't care, I thought it was funny, but the wall would just be knocking. Their bed must have been right up against that thin ass plaster because they were doing some serious fucking. He must have had a big fat fucking fire hydrant dick because bitches were screaming. Wow, I remember that shit so vividly. An old transvestite sat in front of the building night and day. We nicknamed her Man Lady. She named us too. Me, Rudy, and Billy were always addressed as Big Man. And my brother and Joey were called Slim Goody. <laughs> Every time we'd come home after a night of flyering, she'd be sitting out there. Later in the night, the drunker she would be, he or whatever the fuck. I'll take my teeth out and suck the shit out of your dick, he or she would say jokingly. No thanks. We had groupies for that now. My one homie, I'm not going to say his name, but he used to be like, man, I'm seriously thinking about having her suck my dick. And we'd be like, bro, it's not a fucking her, it's a he. You're going to let a man suck your dick. Well, he's, she's got titties somehow. Dog, are you seriously going to let that thing suck your dick? Wow, I'll keep his name silent. <laughs> Our landlord was an old ass white gay man named Tom with an H. Yes, it's Tom with the fresh H. He used to wear a leather studded hat like a fucking dominatrix and a short leather jacket with nothing on under it. He was fucking creepy as fuck and out of his mind. Going to the store like he was in the village people. Butt cheeks all exposed and shit. Even man lady wanted none of that flavor. Tom, how do you say Tom with an H? Tom, Tom, not even the homo spectacle man lady or Tom could compare to the thug. Yes, I'm talking about the one and only original thug. thug. This ninja made thug and cool way before Tupac or Bone Thugs ever made the word thug popular. This dude was so black that all you could see were his fucking yellow eyeballs from across the street. Even in the dark, his eyes would light up the sidewalk in front of him like little headlights. We used to watch him from out our window and see him just beating people's asses every day. If we were going to go to the store across the street, first we'd check to make sure the thug wasn't out. 
We always waited for him to wander off or get arrested before we left the house. We never wanted to cross the thug, but it was fun watching him from the window because he'd just walk up to a crackhead and you could see they were having some sort of discussion and suddenly the thug would just knock him the fuck out. It was so funny. Every time you saw the thug, you knew he was going to punch somebody within 10 minutes. So all he had to do was watch and sure enough, he'd punch a crackhead off his bike or he'd fucking punch a fucking lady. He'd punch anything, man. The thug was so fresh. He was like a character that walked out of a video game. A true to life bad guy who just walked around punching motherfuckers and he never wore a shirt i don't give a fuck how cold it was the thug was shirtless he had a beer belly he was kind of thick kind of muscular and he loved to blow faces out every time joey would spot him from his bedroom window he would scream for all of us to come watch it never failed he would always knock somebody to fuck out every time crackheads would see them two yellow balls emerging from a dark alley and they'd take off <laughs> running in fear hookers would jump in dumpsters and hide whoever was stupid enough to still be standing around when the thug walked up on the scene would always sure as hell get knocked the fuck out we didn't need an alarm clock because every morning at 10 a.m. this little retarded lady would come knocking on our door with something different to sell you wanna buy this toaster no we don't need the toaster does your friend wanna buy this toaster no boom 10 the next morning same thing you wanna buy this lamp? No, I'm straight. Does your friend wanna buy this lamp? No, he's straight. One time I was downtown passing out flyers at City Club. There was this homeless guy out there working the beat. Hey man, buy these incense sticks off me, man. Please, these incense sticks are all I got to sell. He pleaded, I'm homeless, I'm homeless, just come on, help me out. So I bought a couple fucking incense sticks off him and even gave him a couple extra bucks. That night, as I unlocked the door to my apartment, I looked down the hall and there he was. The same fucking guy I bought the incense from was unlocking the door to his apartment. I said, hey man, I thought you were homeless. He just looked at me and said, ha, ah, and then slammed the door. What the fuck? He was just as broke as me. And I'm hooking him up with money, that fucking cocksucker. Check this out. One night, I came home and walked right up the stairwell. As I passed the second floor, I noticed this guy halfway down the hallway with a fucking rifle in his hand. And he was banging on the door yelling, open up, bitch. I just kept walking up to that third floor like I ain't seen shit. When I got into our apartment, I yelled to Joey, hey, man, some guy's on the second floor with a gun. Cut, cut. Now you can hear bullets busting rounds off. We went back to the window. The guy was in the alleyway right across the street where I normally park my truck, putting rounds into his rifle and shooting him into the apartment right below ours, busting out the windows and shit. It was never our style, but we did it. We actually called the police. He was shooting into our fucking building. There's a guy shooting into the building. Listen, I said, and I hung the phone out the window. The guy ran out of ammo, then he would just go back to his truck and reload, and he kept shooting into the building, just taking his time like he had all night. We low crawled across to my brother's apartment. Rob, the cops still ain't here? I was freaking out. Finally, the guy ran out of bullets and drove away. Ten minutes later, one lone fucking cop car finally rolled up. We went out to talk to the cop. Lo and behold, it was a fucking Wayne State College area patroller. Not even a real fucking cop. Mind you, nobody else from the building called the police or went outside. I guess that kind of shit just happens all the time around there. I mean, we would hear automatic gunfire and the echoes of gunfights during the night in our new neighborhood, but never for that long and that consistent. I wasn't complaining though, I fucking loved it down there. It was like the ultimate scrubbiness once again. People wondered how the fuck we could write songs about driving around in hearses killing people. They wondered how we could come up with all this fucking horror comedy stuff. Shit, living in downtown Detroit with fucking characters like that, how could we not? We were representing Detroit and that's all that mattered to us. Even bringing groupies to the apartment was fun. They would be like, you live here? 
<laughs> it, it was dope. They would all see the steam shooting up from the sewers and how ghetto our whole neighborhood looked. We seemed to be living the exact role we were rapping about. It was awesome. When Ringmaster came out, we were paid enough to pay the bills on time. We were single. Everything was cool. Oh, Joey did get arrested for a minute for breaking into a restaurant in Ferndale because he was drunk and hungry one night after a party at his mom's house. I guess he figured some frozen hot dogs would be tasty. Well, once he got inside the place, he found a little surprise. The owner was in the fucking restaurant fucking some chick with the lights off. Joey fought the fuck out of the guy, but he got choked out. The guy was bigger than the undertaker. I never believed Joey about how big this guy was till I went to court with him. And the guy was there. And he looked like one of the fucking road warriors. I don't know if you know who one of the road warriors are, but they're big fucking muscular old school wrestling tag team. Never mind. Joey got probation, which was way better than serving time. But the only bone was he couldn't leave the state for a year. Of course, back then, with the way we had Detroit locked down, he didn't need to leave the state, ever. Alex would give us 50 bucks every morning. We'd drive around in the sidekick, picking up money from record stores and dropping more shit off. And of course, flyer ring. And going into the fucking studio. It was amazing. We were living off the music sales, and there weren't many motherfuckers in Detroit who could say that. Maybe Esham, that's it. Kid Rock didn't have to work, but then again, he never had to. His parents were rich, and everybody knew it. His dad owned a fucking car lot and all kinds of shit. From what he told us, his dad was Bob Ritchie Sr., the guy who owned all them new and used car lots you'd always see commercials for on TV. Of course, that's only my speculation, but now it's officialation. Maybe he never asked his stale-ass dad for shit, I don't know. I'm not hating on Kid Rock, but he did have rich parents, and everybody knew it. Things were getting very, very weird for me and Joey. We were getting famous. People would recognize us at malls. Chicks were always down the fuck right away. But I told you about that sex. It's only half as fresh. For me, this was extra crazy. I've always been ugly. Even before I was fat, I was this ugly kid with a big forehead. Hot chicks let me fuck them to this very fucking day. It was funny as hell to me. Back then, it was all brand new to me, and we took full advantage. We'd meet girls at our shows or at our in-stores, and they'd call our hotline. It was almost like we were daring them to like us. They'd get in their parents' car and drive all the way from their rich-ass suburbs to our ghetto neighborhood. And if they could find a place, we'd meet them in the street and have to blindfold them before taking them up to our apartment. If we didn't, they'd tell everybody else where we lived. The next thing we knew, there would be kids in face paint at our apartment, hound dog us for autographs all day and night and going through our trash and shit we get these girls to our apartment and the first thing out of their mouths was always what are you guys doing living down here this place is gross <laughs> we go on and on about how we were just keeping it real with that 50 bucks every morning we were as rich as we could be anything else we ever had coming went right back into psychopathic Every fucking penny. All we spent was that 50 bucks. The rest of the money, right back into the pot. The thing was, Joe Bruce wasn't ever sexy to these bitches. Violent Jay was. I'd tell the girls my name was Joe, but they kept on calling me Jay. They didn't want to know Joe. It was more fun for them to be hanging out with Jay. So I'd give them Jay. Violent Jay didn't give a fuck how they got home either. If their car got broken into... Well, hey, bitch, remember how I rap about killing people and super glued chicks' titties to the ceiling? Well, that's the guy you fucked, and now you don't give a fuck about how you get home either. <laughs> bitch. It was ruthless, sure, but they wanted Violent J, so they got Violent J. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't look down upon all women because there's the difference between groupies and juggalettes, of course. Juggalettes are women who get respect. Groupies will always use me to get props off their friends, and in turn, I use them for their neddings. Well, I did use them for their neddings. I have to admit and be honest, i far grown out of fucking groupies. I don't find fucking groupies fun anymore. I'm telling you the updated version. In this day and age, fucking a chick who wants to fuck you because she thinks you're famous is not fun. As a matter of fact, to get very personal, it makes my dick go soft. I'll tell you a small story that I use as an example all the time. One time, we were having a party in our bus during the Hell's Pit era, and we had a couple girls in there, and we were having fun playing music, and this hot blonde walked up to me out of nowhere, and she said right in my ear, whispering, 
I want to suck your dick right now. It totally flipped my wig because she was hot as hell. I said, say no more. And I took her right to the back of the bus. And just when it was about to go down, she looked at me in the eyes. She looked up at me and she said, am I going to get like a t-shirt or something for this? My dick instantly went soft. I was crushed. But I use that as an example. I tell people that's what really goes on. You know what I'm saying? It's not real sex. I got money. I could pay for a fine ass hooker if I want. But what kind of sex is that? It's not real. If she don't really find you attractive, it just ain't shit. But when I was a kid, don't get me wrong, I must have fucked. I have no idea. 900, 1,000 Neddens? Honestly. Yes, and I did catch syphilis when I was in my 20s. <laughs> I'll tell it like it is. It was so fucked up. I was hunched over in pain. I didn't want to go to the doctors. I was too embarrassed. My dick looked like a pepperoni pizza. I'm not lying. It was fucking horrible. When I finally went to the doctor, he was like, let me see your dick. And I was like, no. He was like, I got to see your dick if I'm going to do something about it. And I said, you don't want to see my dick, doctor. And I finally pulled out my fucking pizza stick. And he looked at it for a half a second and he was like, syphilis. And he gave me a shot. And I swear to you, no lie, five days later, my dick was perfect. It was spotless. Whatever was in that shot was a miracle drug because the syphilis dried up and shot right out my pee hole and it was gone forever. Wow. I don't know why I just fucking admitted all that, but it's true. And it went away and I don't have it anymore. Fuck you if you think I still got it. My dick is super squeaky clean. I'll fucking show anybody. You can fucking sniff it if you want. It smells like fucking apples. <laughs> <laughs> we had groupies, record sales, 50 bucks every morning on time, and local stardom. Still, no record deal. Mind you, this was before major labels were realizing regional shit can be powerful. This was back when, like, Master P and No Limit Bound Stuff was selling two or three hundred thousand copies down south, yet not selling anything up north or out west. Nelly was a superstar in St. Louis, but nobody would give it a shot nationally. We were white kids in clown makeup making some noise in Detroit suburbs and not anywhere else. No labels wanted to fuck with us. We figured we'd give some local record biz types their shot at getting us signed to see what would happen. The first guy was named Rick Trophy. We met him at a recording studio called The Disc one day. He led us into his office and right away he was just, well, not as bad as Awesome Dre's manager with the handcuffed suitcase, but close enough. You want a deal? I'll get you a deal, he said. He was such a fucking character. Do you know who I am? No. Do you know how lucky you are to be sitting here in my office? You don't know who I am? No. Do you know who Danny Kay is? Yes. Yes, I do. Finally, something I can say yes to. Getting schooled on Danny Kay. Danny Kay was like a legend to us. Not in the form of Esham or Awesome Dre, though. Danny Kay was kind of, well touched. Danny Kay was a half-retarded redneck kid from some city I have never heard or been to but called East China and it's in Michigan. I don't know where the fuck East China was. We even looked at a map of Michigan trying to find East China, Michigan and it wasn't even on the fucking map but somehow that's where Danny Kay's from. Danny Kay was just fucking wrong. His music was so bad, so off, so terrible, and so shitty that it was awesome. You have to understand, some shit is so bad that it flips over and becomes good. It becomes fresh. Some shit is so fucking awful that it's dope. I can't explain it. We loved it. We collected all of Danny Kaye's releases. He was legendary to us. His rap was like the paintings mental patients do. Innocent, but amazing. He had songs called Track and Field, an after school snack attack. You know songs like that were the lamest shit you could ever imagine, but that made them incredible. Just listen to some Danny K. Sitting home thinking how to rock it, then it came to me as a sudden shock. That's a right around my bus, every word right on time. time. Hip-hop began as time, must have been early, about 79. DJs cut records while MCs put the rhymes. 
Mikey Clark was the first to introduce us to Danny Kaye's amazingly funny music. I guess Kid Rock showed Mike. Every rapper in Detroit keeps the Danny Kay collection close by. Even Eminem loves Danny Kay. His beats sometimes weren't even programmed. It was like his engineers made his shit deliberately bad so Danny would fire him. Then they could go work on something else, anything else. Danny Kay was a hero to us because in his own way, he had brought us real legitimate joy. He did his own thing and let the rest of the world try to figure it out. Nobody ever did. He was without a doubt the worst rapper we had ever heard, which made him the most fucking spectacular. And it made him the best at something, at being terrible, which made him the best terrible rapper ever. Even if it is making horrible music, Danny Kay was the best at it. Just enjoy some more, Danny K. Listen. Listen to the rhymes. How could you not think that's fresh? It's fucking awesome. Let me give you a little update on Danny K. He moved to Alaska. Yes, where else would Danny K move? From East China, Michigan to fucking Igloo, Alaska, all right? And he lives there now, and he's so fresh, he still raps. And you know what? At the 2015 Gathering of the Juggalos, we booked Danny K. That's right. I'm telling you something right now. Listen to my fucking words. Me and Joey sat front row and watched Danny fucking K perform. He wanted a first class ticket on his rider. He wanted, I don't remember what he wanted, but he wanted some delicious hot food and he wanted a chauffeur and he wanted to sell his merchandise. And he did because by then there were plenty of juggalos that knew the legend of Danny Kay. Just from releasing this book and talking to juggalos, word has spread to many juggalos and they've learned about the legend of the K. And now he spells his name Danny K-A-E. And I said, Danny, what does the A-E stand for? And he looked me in the eye. For some reason, he only looked at my left eye. And he said, always, always excelling. Always excelling. Always excelling. So fresh. Danny K-A-E. Always excelling. How fucking dope is that? I get chills from my toes up and out of my anus, up my spine, up my neck and through my ear holes. I just get so much enjoyment from the K-A-E. Always, I gotta get back to the story. Rick continued, see, I'm the one who got Danny K in the Harmony House. If I can do that, I can do any business. True, I gotta give that to Rick Trophy. Danny K was available at all 36 Harmony House locations. And that means Nobody at Harmony House is actually screening what they sell for freshness. It just matters who you are. And obviously, Rick Trophy was somebody if he got Harmony House to pick up the Danny K collection. <laughs> so fresh. We were sold right there. If this ninja was really the guy who got Danny K in the fucking the Harmony House chain, then he was right. He could do anything. Then again, for him to be bragging about getting Danny K into a record store chain, my God, we didn't know whether to laugh or shake his hand. We figured we'd give him a shot. We told him our sales figures, which totaled over 150,000 units. He couldn't believe we sold all those units. Then I said, you'll see, we're going to sell out the Ritz twice in a row, two nights in a row. He said, if you do that without a record deal, You'll be the greatest unsigned group in the history of Detroit. Well, we're going to do it. And we did. We sold out Friday and Saturday night. Two nights in advance. That's a total of 3,600 tickets just to see a local unsigned group. It was fucking unreal. I ain't going to tell you how dope these shows were because that's not the point. You don't read about ICP shows. You go to them. Juggalos know what I mean. The point was, these guys still couldn't find us a deal. The labels know you sold all those records, but they think you're just some novelty regional thing. Like it's some kind of weird local phenomenon, Rick explained. Like the same reason the football fans in Milwaukee wear cheese on their heads. People in Detroit like us, but only people in Detroit. Like we're some dumb local thing that couldn't possibly connect with the youth of America. Shit. 
What we couldn't connect with was hearing no and hearing that ICP wouldn't work nationally. That's what we couldn't connect with. We hooked up with another local player, Bruce Lorfield, who finally got us a meeting with Atlantic Records in New York. Bruce Lorfield was about his job. Mind you, they didn't pay for our flights or nothing, so Joey and I drove our sidekick all the way to New York City on our own dime. We listened to the ringmaster on the way there a thousand times and got psyched up. To this day, the ringmaster album is many Juggalo's favorite shit. Murder Go Round, the first version of Chicken Hunting, Wagon, Fun House, House of Mirrors, all those songs are on there. We got to New York and we went up into that meeting in a tall ass building with our heads held high. Our attitude was that we'd done something in Detroit that any major label would want to see happen on a national level. We sold out the Ritz two nights in a row. I walked around that room full of record company executives and I gave them our whole plan from the purely sellout point of view. I knew they could relate to that. Record companies don't care what you could sound like. They just want to make money off you in any way they can. Listen, we're blowing up in our city and we are the largest group there. We can do the same thing in any town, any city, everywhere out there nationwide with your help. Think of the money that is to be made out there because it's already spreading out from Detroit. With the Joker's cars, we have a growing history that people can get into. It's all very marketable. I went on and on and on like a sellout bitch. I sounded like a hoe doing my best to become a fucking sellout bitch. I didn't really believe the shit I was saying. I knew it's authenticity and freshness that sells CDs, but I was trying to tell them what I thought they wanted to hear. Joey stood behind me dropping yups and uh-huh anywhere he could. We both never tried to sell anything harder than we did that day. When I was done, flat out, they just said, no thank you. We'll take the pass option. One guy even said, you're not what I'm looking for. We can't use you here at Atlantic Records. Why not, I asked. Fuck it, I had nothing to lose. Well, it's too violent he said. So I brought up other violent acts that are successes, like the Ghetto Boys, who were hitting it big with mind playing tricks on me at that very time. Well, the clown makeup and the stuff you're rapping about, it's, it's just, it's got to be a local thing. It'll never happen anywhere else. Never happen anywhere else. Never happen everywhere. Joey and I got back in the fucking sidekick and took the fuck off. We were devastated at first. I remember it took us about three or four hours to find that place in busy ass New York City. Yet on the way out, we were somehow back on the freeway towards home in 10 minutes. I was fucking pissed. I even called Alex and yelled at him. He was just as crushed as we were. I fucking wanted answers. Why? After we sold all them fucking records, can't we find shit? We were so pissed off the whole way back. As we made our way back home through Pennsylvania and Ohio, we were just confused and more pissed. We'd stop for gas, and the kids working at the counter would just be like us, talking about the same shit as us, laughing with us. What the fuck? The record companies wouldn't even have to sell us to them. We were them. We were regular scrubs, and they're scrubs. Everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere! Once we hit Detroit, we crossed over Del Rey on I-75 and saw the factories and the yellow smoke hanging over the city full of juggalos below us. I thought to myself, when I was a kid, I never really missed money. We love being flubes and having no money. Yeah, sure, we had some money now, but what I wanted more than anything was to get props off my rapping skills. We thought we'd get it by getting a fat-ass record deal. God, we were stupid. We wind up spending years trying to get a fucking record deal. Then the rest of our time trying to get out of the record deal. What the fuck did we know? We were just a couple of clowns. Back at home, we continued to do what we did best. Be the fucking underground kings of Detroit. Brother, we got damn good at it. Psychopathic Records was in full fizz at. We recorded Joey's solo EP. Fuck off right away. We even put out a Christmas record. Well, our version of one called Carnival Christmas with songs like Santa's a Fat Bitch. Shut 
sure it was a joke, but at least we were having fun with it. It wasn't time to record another Joker's card, so we just stuck to all the little fun EPs and records like Forgotten Freshness, full of outtakes and stuff. We were putting out different little records and collectibles, and Juggalos were eating them up, and it was mad fun. Merchandise was flying out of the door. Everything from lighters to keychains to our fresh comic book. Creative Vince, the t-shirt guy we first met back in the day before the Esham show, was now working full time for Psychopathic Records. We were giving them so much business, even without a record deal, we were doing fine. We were feeling a little high and mighty and signed another group to our record label, a group of kids from Flint called Project Born. They were still in high school when we met them, so we had to buy them school clothes as part of their advance. They didn't drive, so we always had to drive an hour out to Flint to pick them up to do radio interviews or whatever we had going on. The real reason we signed them was because we wanted to find the next Dayton family. The Dayton family was this hot new group from Flint, and they were just like us, selling thousands and thousands of albums only in their own home city of Flint and nowhere else. We thought we found the next big Flint phenomenon with Project Born, but we thought wrong. Trouble was, the first tape Project Born gave us, which we loved and made us want to sign them in the first place, had somehow gotten lost. What? The record they wound up recording in place of it kind of sucked. It was all right. It was way, way different and shittier than the first stuff we heard from them. But what could we do? We put it out and it flopped, basically. We learned Juggalos liked us because they liked the flavor we were putting out. We couldn't just take any shitty album, throw a Hatchaman logo on it, and expect it to sell. So eventually, we had to drop them. Project Born were young in the game, and they have developed their skills since then. But because they started dissing us right after that record, we could never work with them in a big way again until later. Everything became cool with Project Born again. We just did a show with them about a year and a half ago. They're the shit. They're still rapping. And God bless them. We wish them the best of luck. They're our homies. We didn't really think much of it when we recorded The Terror Wheel in 1994 in EP. We just thought it was another dope-ass EP for Juggalos to bump. We didn't know what to put on the cover, so we looked through Mikey Clark's albums at the studio. We found a Moby album from way back in the day that had a picture of this guy with his head being stretched. Hell yeah! Here's our cover, I said. We cut it out right there and sent it to the pressing plant. We straight up stole it from Moby. I guess we figured nobody would ever notice we were such a regional thing. Plus, we thought nobody had heard of Moby. And to our surprise, a year later, Moby blew the fuck up. And here we are stealing his album cover and putting it on the cover of Terror Wheel. It's still on the cover of Terror Wheel. Awesome. awesome. We were getting used to being local heroes. Our shit was selling enough that we could all buy new cars. I had my best friends working with us. We weren't hanging out in the Detroit band scene or anything. We were in our own scene, flying in all day and watching wrestling videos all night in our ghetto hideaway. Even after the Project Born mistake, once we released the Terror Wheel EP, it was all good again. Detroit belonged to us. Isham was just behind us, yet he was still, as usual, big in the overhaul race. Kid Rock was nowhere to be found at this time. The only other crew even worth mentioning was a local Isham ripoff group called the House of Crazies, who were taking down our flyers and throwing them in the garbage, and not even being discreet about it at the time. And we knew they were doing it because Lori, who worked at the record store and was my girlfriend a while ago, she's the one who saw him doing it. Their name will come up again in the ICP story later on. More proof of how strangely the Dark Carnival works. Once we put the terror wheel out, Alex figured just for the fuck of it, he'd head back down to the radio stations in Detroit just to see what would happen. Well, what happened was that 96.3 FM actually picked up Dead Body Man off the EP and put it into heavy, full rotation. What the fuck? Nobody could fucking believe it. Dead Body Man shot the number one, and boom, ICP had a local radio hit. Un fucking believable If you listen to Dead Body Man and picture it on the radio, it's like, what the fuck? 
It was actually on the air 24-7. And this wasn't no shitty sellout song either. If you listen to Dead Body Man, it's a regular ICP horror classic. And for some crazy, strange reason, local radio took it and played it just as it was. They just flipped a few of the fucks and shits reverse, and it was a hit. Every time you turned on the radio, you'd hear Dead Body Man. Believe me, we didn't turn the radio off. We kept that bitch on day and night, even when I sleep at night. Every time Dead Body Man came on, I'd wake up and hear that shit. It was crazy. Some juggalos weren't really too happy about Dead Body Man on the radio because we were their band and the radio play made us everybody's band. I can understand. The way I looked at it, we were at least getting the props we should have gotten way back from Dog Beats. We worked harder than any other band from our first tape on and now we were finally getting recognized for it. I fucking loved it, I won't lie. Dead Body Man on the radio was awesome. The local weekly entertainment magazine even did a cover story on us. The Metro Times, they talked more about our marketing tactics than our rapping, but at least they acknowledged we existed. Promoters were even starting to notice. We tried to book our own show in Monroe, this weird little town near the Ohio border, down I-75, and there was a record store there that was selling a shitload of our albums. The local promoter was like, I'm not going to give you guys your own show, but I have two short coming here to play, and if you guys can do that show, we'll give you five grand. What? If you don't know the name Too Short, he is the shit. He's this pimp-ass rapper from Oakland, California. He had some hits like Freaky Tales, Cuss Words, and Life Is Too Short and more. We were always fans of Too Short, so we agreed to do a show with him with the quickness. At first, we were afraid. We thought we'd get booed off stage or something if we did the show. When we showed up... In Monroe, it was all ICP fans. Too short played to nothing but painted fucking faces. We were outdrawn platinum selling rap legends. In Michigan, that Too Short show was no fluke. Not long after that, we played a show in Toledo with Outkast, MC Breed, Coolio, and some other fucking idiot, I don't remember his name, who had a hit song. Not Father MC, but one of them fucking guys. We were the biggest name going in local rap, so the promoters booked us for that show, and it was at the Toledo Sports Arena. Once again, we thought for sure it was going to be a crowd there to see those other acts, and they were just going to boo us off stage. As we drove down to the Toledo Sports Arena to do the show, we kept hearing Dead Body Man on the radio. It was crazy fresh. We were full of karma. We pulled up to the arena. It wasn't sold out, but it was all painted faces in a crowd in the line waiting to get in. It was fucking awesome I can feel it now man it felt so good we were so relieved to see those juggalos in line it was so fucking dope good times good times none of those guys outcasts none of those motherfuckers had a clue who we were yet all the fucking fans did after the show outcasts did too only because we got fago on their turntables and they wanted to kick our asses for it they were like man you got our fucking turntables wet we want a $500 cleaning fee we were like, what? $500 to clean your fucking turntables? I'll wipe them off right now with my t-shirt. They were like, no. These are special custom turntables, and they're fucking wet with sticky fucking soda, and we want 500 bucks, because that's what's going to cost to have them clean. And we were like, man, you guys sold a million fucking records, and you want 500 bucks from us to clean your fucking turntables? But their crew surrounded us, so 500 bucks it was, right into the hand of Andre 3000. As our car drove home that night, the sticky, sweet, lovely smell of Fago still in our car, Dead Body Man came on the radio. We were on top of the fucking world. We decided to celebrate with our first Hollow Wicked Clown Show, the first of what would become our annual Hollow Wicked shows in Detroit. Just the hardcore juggalos and us. At this point, we could sell out any 2,000 seat theater in the city, but we decided to book Holla Wicked at the Majestic Theater, this old ass 1,000 person theater in downtown Detroit where Harry Houdini did his last performance before he died or some shit. We pressed up a Halloween song called Dead Pumpkins that we give away to all the juggalos who came to the show. That was our fresh idea to make the show special. We'd give a special CD with a Halloween song on it to everybody who came. We knew tickets would go fast, but we wanted this show to be 
intimate between us and the Juggalos. You best believe, once again, we promoted the hell out of it. It wasn't like we just booked the show and waited for people to show up. We were out there in full force again, flying up J.C. Barrymore's and anywhere again, my brother Rudy, Billy, Joey, me, all of us, just like always, working our asses off. And you can also best believe it paid off. All of downtown Halloween 94 was Juggalos painted up. All the party stores sold out of Fago in the area from kids coming down to the show and spraying it on each other in line. They were true Juggalos. 1994, baby, the first Hollow Wicked. They all left with a free CD of Dead Pumpkins bumping in their radio. It was the shit. Now, what we didn't find out until right before the show was that Bruce Lorfield, the guy who was still trying to get us a record deal, had been in contact with a a guy named Jeff Fenster, the head A&R of Jive Records. Jive Records was hugely, hugely successful back then. They had the Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, Too Short, fucking Spice One. Jive Records was a huge record label. And for some reason now, they're out of business. Maybe it's because CDs don't sell anymore. They don't even make them anymore. And record labels are going out of business left and right. Even the biggest, most successful ones like Jive Records went right the fuck out of business because the future is a motherfucker. But we're talking about the past right now. At that time, Jive was the biggest rap label out there with mad groups, Boogie Down Productions, The Tribe Called Quest, all that New York shit was signed to Jive Records. Supposedly, word was, Too Short was the guy who told Jeff Fenster about us first after our, or his, excuse me, Monroe show. Bruce Lorfield then got Jeff to fly all the way into Detroit for our big Hollow Wicked show, and he was just blown away. Just like always, everybody was blown away when they saw our shit live. We also had all kinds of stage props, and all our homies dressed up like graveyard characters. It wasn't just a concert, it was a haunted house with an 808 beat. It worked. Jeff Fenster called Alex three days later and informed him that they wanted to sign the Insane Clown Posse to Jive Records. Woo! Amazing! Finally! We made it! The time had officially finally come for a major record label to come take our circus show worldwide! We thought signing to a big label like Jive Records meant we fucking made it! This would finally mean the end of our non-stop five-year promoting binge! Brother, little did we know, it would just be the beginning!